Good evening, friends. Welcome to this lecture series being organized by India International Center on Sustainable Agriculture. Today we have Dr. Sachin Kumar Sharma, who is with the Center for WTO Studies at Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, New Delhi. This center was set up when Mr. Murasoli Maran was the Commerce Minister and Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee was the Prime Minister. It was an excellent move as it is preparing not only the Indian officials, but also the officials from several other developing countries to prepare them for negotiating with the developed countries at the WTO fora. It is not easy as you will see in the presentation, which has been very carefully and diligently prepared by Dr. Sharma. Today's topic is WTO negotiations and Indian agriculture. There is a common feeling that India got a raw deal and there are a lot of doubts in the minds of public about how we committed to so many things in our WTO negotiations. So I will request Dr. Sharma to please take about 35 to 40 minutes in clearing these doubts and then we will have question and answer session. Those of you who have registered online will see a window on your laptops or on your mobile phones. You can put your comments or your questions in that window. Over to you, Dr. Chan. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank Indian International Center and uh, Siraj Hussain to provide me this opportunity to present, uh, to make a presentation on this sensitive issue on WTO and Indian agriculture. This issue is not relevant only for uh, Indian farmers, but also farmers across LDC and developing countries. I try to make this uh, presentation in uh, 11 questions so that uh, audience able to understand what is going on in WTO negotiation and how they can relate with the Indian agriculture. I'm sharing my PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Yes. So my presentation is on WTO negotiations and Indian agriculture issues and sensitivities. What I am doing, I am doing uh, what, how I outline this presentation. I raise 11 questions and I'm trying to answer one by one. So uh, I'm just starting with the first question. Are Indian farmers facing an unfair and uneven playing field in the international trade scenario? The answer is yes. If we uh, see per farmer domestic support in developed country, the developed country are providing huge support to their farmers. The per farmer support in US, Switzerland and Norway is more than 50,000 US dollar per annum. Whereas if we take the case of Indian farmer, uh, Indian farmer receives about 282 US dollar per annum uh, support through different uh, agriculture programs. Now, question is, why the farmers in developing country of India, they are concerned about the subsidies given by the developed country? The answer is very simple, that if the developed country are giving huge subsidies to their own agriculture or their farmers, then what will happen, the production will go up in those countries. And then what they will do, they will import less or they will export in the international market. Uh, in both cases, the international prices will be depressed and uh, once the international price is depressed, it will displace the farmers from developing and LDC countries and uh, their income will also adversely affect by uh, the support measures implemented in the developed country. Now the farmers in developing country are not only facing challenges at the external front, even they change multiple challenges at the domestic front as well. If we see the average farm size in selected members in Australia, Canada, US, the farm size is very, very high in compared to India's average land holding size. Average land holding size in India is 1.08 hectares. So we have low farm size and low domestic support uh, 
in India and as well as in developing country. And these farmers has to compete the farmers from the developed country. And therefore, yes, the playing field is unfair and uneven. The second question, are WTO rules are biased against developing countries? The answer is yes. Why? Let's, I gave the example of cotton. If you are a farmer, cotton farmer in India or developing country, then how much subsidy or support you can provide to the farmers? The limit is 10%. But in case of developed country, they are not constrained by this limit. They can provide more support. For example, US has given 74% subsidy to cotton in 2001. Even the EU has provided 139% subsidy to cotton farmers as a percentage of value of production. So the farmers in India, the limit is only 10%, whereas the farmers in developed country, they have more entitlement in terms of domestic support. I'm giving the second example of dairy sector. In case of dairy, the maximum limit which Indian government provide the sport, domestic sport is 10% of value of production in a year. However, in developed country, they have flexibility, they can cross, they can provide high subsidies. Uh, US, EU, Canada, they, these are the countries which are providing subsidies to their farmer, use subsidies. And the, the important point is this, that in developed country, they support through different programs. Just I give you an example, one example. If you have one cattle, then you get one subsidy. If that cattle gives milk, then you get milk subsidy. And when you slaughter, slaughter that cattle, you get meat subsidy. Three subsidy for one cattle. Just and how much the farmers in the developing country are getting. So the rules are biased. Now, now why these rules are biased? Therefore, that we need to go to uh, the Uruguay round negotiation. In, uh, in that period, during 1986 uh, onwards to 1994, and especially the base year 1986 to 88, developed those countries who were providing huge subsidies, they were rewarded in terms of additional flexibility to provide support in future as well. Whereas those countries who are honest, who are suffering from uh, uh, the adverse impact of uh, uh, high subsidy from the developed country, they were penalized. They were penalized in terms that their subsidy was constrained or capped at a very low level. Due to this flexibility, developed country are, were, uh, are able to give more subsidy to their agriculture sector. Just I give the example. EU has given 177% domestic support to sugar cane producers and even 139% to the cotton farmers without breaching any limit. And what about India? The India and most of the developing country, the limit is only 10%. If you cross or breach this 10% limit, then there is a problem which I will discuss later. Now, but how much subsidy, the, uh, just I comparing how much subsidy or domestic support uh, different countries can give. Now, as I discussed with you, that developed members have additional flexibility to give support to farmers. Now, in case of rice, if that flexibility is concentrated only in one agriculture product in 2016, then US, how much subsidy or domestic support they can provide? 800% of value of rice. EU can provide more than 700% of value of production as a product specific score. Even in wheat, EU can provide more than 300% as value of production. But what, have, what about India? What about Kenya? What about other least developed country or developing country? The limit is only 10%. And these countries are giving huge support. And once if you uh, go through the practical or if you do the research in this uh, on agreement on agriculture, what we found that is not survival of the financial fittest. If it is the financial fattest, that if you have more money, you can survive in the international market. 
by giving support to your own agriculture farmers at the expense of farmers this low income resource poor farms of the developing country next question what are the challenges faced by india regarding minimum support price policy because this is very contentious issue and very important for for india and most of the developing country as well because it's this policy not implemented only in india even pakistan bangladesh even nepal has started in 2016 for rice as well china indonesia morocco kenya there are so many countries who are implementing price support policy now question how much support indian uh, indian government can give to a particular crop under the msp the answer is 10% of value of production of that crop for a relevant year for example in 2020 how much we can provide to cotton it is 10% of total value of cotton in 2020 and what is the msp msp the minimum spot price under this the government uh, if market price fall below the target price then government agencies interfere in the market they procure at the msp to protect farmers from price fluctuation now i told you that limit is 10% but the next question how you calculate subsidy this is a very important question how you the limit is 10% but how you compute the subsidy the formula is that you compare msp with the external reference price and we multiply that difference with the eligible production now msp already i defined that msp is for the current year what is the erp what is the external reference price it is the export or import price which were prevailing during 1986 88 and when we do the calculation this erp remain fixed for the calculation purposes so this is the formula how we calculate the market price support you compare minimum support price of rice or wheat or cotton in 2020 with a export or import price of that particular crop during the base year and then we multiply the difference with eligible production the whole calculation the value of this whole calculation should be less than 10% of value of production of that crop now what is the eligible production eligible production india uh, what the approach we have india had taken only that portion of market surplus which is procured by government agency at uh, is not aam aadmi party is applied administered price and for a developed country what they argue that in case there no target fixed then whole production is entitled to receive support so the formula is this that msp you compare msp with the erp and then you multiply with eligible production and the eligible production in case of india notification is the only that portion of market surplus which is procured by fci or other government agencies now what is the problem with this formula the problem is that you are we are comparing msp for current year with the external reference price which is based on 1986 88 for instance the erp for wheat was rupees 3500 rupees per ton during 1986 88 and now what is the price of msp what is the msp is more than 90000 rupees per ton now if you are comparing msp with the erp of 9886 you are bound to cross your 10% limit and by using this in uh, rupees there are many countries like australia us canada they are alleging that india has exceeded its 10% limit in case of rice wheat sugar cotton and pulses and they are saying that uh, through msp the government is giving support for more than 50% of value production if the farmers are getting that much support in india then why farmers frequently they are protesting because the formula is wrong 
you are we are comparing a msp of current year with the erp of 1986-88 now for uh, just i give you an example if for my father used to earn 3000 rupees during 1986-88 and now i earn 10000 rupees would you say that i'm better off than my father no because over the period the inflation had increased and if we not consider inflation in this calculation then you will get the inflated number regarding minimum support minimum uh, the price support calculations now under wto yes there is uh, article r18.4 where during the calculation we can consider inflation and it's it say that we can consider excessive inflation but the question is what is the excessive inflation is not defined at all the second is that it is not the right of the member if even if you do the calculation with inflation and if you submit your notification other country will still they challenge that why you have used the inflation for instance jordan has you uh, consider inflation because jordan has crossed in case of wheat they notified in uh, by uh, considering inflation but the question has been raised by developed country why the inflation has been used the another issue here that is not about excessive inflation even if you have two percent inflation over the period of time even two percent annual inflation if it's is the cumulative effect would be much more and by this way the country who is implementing minimum support kind of policies bound to breach their limit so that's the problem if you cross that 10 percent limit what will happen then other country will take you to the dispute and if you're not able to defend the dispute then you have to modify or you have to eliminate that policy that's the simple so this is that that's why the msp policy has been challenged why this policy developed country are challenging this and questioning at the wto because they want the market access because if you don't have the msp the farmers will not get incentive and if farmer not get incentive or if the production uh, it will if not uh, if they don't have any safety net then the then farmers will face losses and this uh, this is how the other countries will export their products in india and they will capture the market indian market by displacing the poor farmers of india and this is the uh, graph i am showing that comparison of msp and the erp if uh, you see this two uh, the red line and the yellow line the red line is the e erp in indian rupees and then uh, the yellow line is in is the msp you, you can see the gap between red line and the yellow line is increasing over the period of time now you can't consider inflation so what the uh, so many countries even uh, what they are doing they are notifying in the us dollar bangladesh pakistan even brazil us uh, brazil russia they are notifying in us currency why because if we uh, notify in us currency then through currency depreciation the gap between erp and msp would be minimized that can be reflected in the upper to the green and the orange one the erp is around 272 us dollar and most of the year most of uh, many of the year this msp remain below the erp that's why when we do the calculation for many years our domestic support the product specific support for wheat remained negative but now recently it become positive because our msp in us dollar is higher than the erp next question why are india's food policy under question at the wto now what is our food security policy in india the government announced minimum support price the government agency procured at the msp then the government agency stored it and distributed it uh, through pds system the expenditure on food subsidy for the consumer side is uncapped any country can provide uh, uh, 
subsidy uh, subsidized food grains without any limit in india we provide uh, uh, annually 18 billion us dollar still we have 195 billion people in india who are suffering from malnutrition and india population is around 1.35 billion people are there less the case of us us also provide food security to its people how much us spend spent uh, us spend more than 102 us uh, 102 billion us dollar annually and what is the total population of us is around 350 billion so you can see that even rich country they are securing the interest of their consumer now if the government can provide consumer subsidies to its uh, without any limit then why this issue is based at the wto the question is about the procurement as indian government procure food grains at the minimum spot price this is limited this procurement as i earlier discussed it is limited the total spot is limit by 10% of value of production of rice or wheat if this limit is breach then there is a risk of procure uh, risk to the procurement mechanism dismantling or modifying why the uh, developed country are uh, uh, attacking this food security policy the simple uh, is that the simple point is that they wanted to capture indian market because if they wanted to export wheat in the indian market the us russia many other countries they were they wanted to export food grains the cereal in indian market they wanted to capture that market and if there is no msp then you know that what will the impact of uh, uh, absence of msp on the farming and the production so this is how this whole uh, food security policy has been under attack at the wto if you uh, go through any uh, document related to committee on agriculture at the wto you will find that lot of questions had been raised about minimum spot price policy over the period of time the simple thing is that there is naked market naked commercial interest of some countries uh, at the expense of food security of million of poor people and resource poor farmers as well now in case of rice in uh, last year uh, we have cross our limit of 10% now as already told you that if we cross 10% limit as a value of production for rice other country can take us to the dispute now what happened that we have the in case of rice our product specific spot was more than 11% then why other country had not taken us to the dispute because india invoked peace clause under the peace clause even a developing country cross its limit of 10% or the specific uh, commitment for food security purposes other country will not take uh, that particular country for uh, to the dispute now we have invoked the peace clause but this peace clause have lot of restrictions first only traditional staple crops are covered under this program that existed in or before 2030 it means future programs are not covered by peace clause the cash crops are not covered by the peace clause in india's notification the crops which are covered wheat rice horse cereal and pulses is mentioned in india's notification then there are onerous conditions to be satisfied in terms of notification and in terms of that public stock holding programs should not distort the food security of the other people especially there are uh, this catch is that about uh, members are raising that uh, the issue that we can't uh, export in the international market from the public stock holding this is the question repeatedly asked at the committee on agriculture next question 
is the indian government constrained to provide input subsidies to farmers under the wto the answer is no indian government is not constrained at all why because under the wto we have development box uh, under the article 6.2 this is a special and differential treatment for the developing countries under this article if a developing country provide input subsidies to low income or resource poor farmer then there is no limit in india we provide input subsidies like fertilizer power subsidy irrigation subsidies so the question arises here who are low income or resource poor farmers in india now we have defined low income or resource poor farmer on the basis of land holding size if a farmer in india has land holding up to 10 hectares then we have classified that farmer under low income or resource poor farmers as per this definition are 99.43% farmers are categorized as low income or resource poor farmers we have provided 24 billion us dollar input subsidies due uh, in 2018 and 19 and this flexibility is only applicable for developing members except china china is not entitled for this development box next question but is india demanding in context of disciplining the trade distorting sport the first demand is the elimination of additional flexibility which the developed country had due to this additional flexibility as i mentioned earlier us can provide more than 800% product specific sport to rice due to additional entitlement even for corn you can provide more than 700% by using the additional flexibility under one crop so what is the demand of india or developing country the demand is that the policy space of developed country should be capped at 5% of value of production and the uh, developing country including african countries ldc they are demanding that this additional entitlement should be eliminated for the developed country if is this ams entitlement is eliminated then the domestic sport in developed country would be restricted to 5% of value of production if that is restricted that they will not able to give uh, trade distorting sport to their own farmers and then it will be beneficial for um uh, farmers in developing and ldc countries uh, because they have art uh, because they have natural competitive advantage in the agriculture production due to low labor cost then the another is a demand is the formula for mps which covers india's minimum sport price policy as mentioned earlier that the erp when we do the calculation for the market price sport we do we compare the our minimum price sport policy with the external reference price based on 1986-88 now the demand is that the external reference price should not be based on 86-88 but should be based on some current year maybe average last 3 years import or export prices so this is the one demand by this uh, way the the uh, inflated uh, sport which the developed country they are alleging that we are it will be very negligible it will come down drastically come down so this is the one of uh, the demand another demand of uh, to change the erp the next is to provide special and differential treatment for the developing members in the negotiation in the negotiation what is happening the members are attacking our whatever the limited policy space we have of 10% they wanted to reduce this 10% to some uh, to cap it more lower level then another is that as uh, that uh, under the development box 
under which we are providing input subsidies to Indian farmers, they also want to limit that box in the negotiation. So these are the three demands that uh, developed countries should eliminate AMS entitlement. The ERP should be uh, based on uh, current years. Then there should be special and differential treatment for the developing members in the negotiation. But what is happening in the negotiation? What are the counter narratives are being put forth to attack domestic support measures of developing countries, including India? I, there, the demands already I mentioned uh, by the developing members, but the developed countries are doing, they are attempt, their attempts have been made to belittle the demand of developing members. But they are saying that additional flexibility the developed member have, it is diminishing over the period of time. Uh, the point here is that the additional entitlement is, is fixed in uh, monetary terms. As value of production increase, the percentage of that additional entitlement as a value of production would, is declining. So what they are saying that uh, uh, now additional entitlement is diminishing over the period of time. Now, if this is the claim, then why developed country are not agreeing with the demand of developing country that they should eliminate their AMS entitlement? What's the problem in it? Then they are misrepresenting the facts. What they are doing? They are saying that India can provide subsidy up to 10% of value of production of a crop and input subsidies and then 10% uh, as a non-product specific. Because they have 10% as a value of production they can provide. With value of production as increase, the entitlement of India, China, Indonesia would be highest by 2030. By this narrative, they are dividing the developing country. Also, they are make, trying to make the narrative that, that due to the policy of these countries, the LDC, the farmers in other countries are suffering. And by using this narrative, what they are targeting? They are targeting to dilute the development box. They are trying to dilute the de minimis limit, which is 10%. They wanted to reduce from 10 to a lower level, which I discuss uh, in the next slide. And they want to dilute this whole uh, box, de development box, which is the SNT provisions for the developing country. And in this regard, various proposals have been submitted by the members. And what are the proposals, what are the approaches these uh, has been discussed in the uh, related to the domestic support? There are two main approaches has been uh, now uh, on the table. One is a fixed reference period and second floating model approach uh, to cap uh, trade distorting subsidy support. Now, what is the fixed reference period that you uh, that a member fix the a limit in monetary terms and it will remain fixed for the future as well just assume that uh, for india is just uh, 10 billion us dollar then in future also india can can't give uh, support more than 10 per 10 billion us dollar what is the floating model that that it the limit is defined in terms of as a percentage of value production as value production go up, the limit will also go up. Beside this approach, the issue where uh, is that but but this limit would cover. Now the attempt has been made to include development box expenditure under this limit. Now if and then the other is to reduce the de minimis limit for the developing countries. Now if the SNDT these provisions are included in the OTDS limit, then it would be extremely difficult for developing country to implement domestic support program which are compatible with their socio-economic situation. And when I uh, when we uh, dig out uh, what is the implications of these proposals. But we found that developing members generally have to undertake higher cuts than developed members. 
which highlights the asymmetries in the negotiations. Even in terms of, even if you calculate the per farmer entitlement, then entitlement of developing members under various proposals kept at very low level in compared to the developed members, which effectively show that there is no ascendancy provisions in the negotiation. And there is, there is SND provision for the developed country instead. So why the question, next question, why is there a need for per farmer domestic sport entitlement approach in the negotiation? Now I did some calculation and uh, uh, my team at the Center for WTO Studies, they, we estimated the the per farmer domestic sport entitlement under the amber box now farmers uh, the canada us eu has high per farmer sport entitlement for example us can provide amber box sport per farmer 29000 us dollar under the amber box in 2020 whereas india's entitlement is capped only 500 534 US dollar. And in case this asymmetry is not addressed, trade rules would be further skewed and in favor of developed members at the expense of low, uh, low income or resource poor farmers in developing countries. Now let's assume uh, it's a different scenario I'm discussing. In a scenario where India has per farmer entitlement equal to that of the US. Just all the farmers should have equal entitlement. Let's assume that all farmers have equal entitlement irrespective of uh, countries uh, where they are living. In case India farmer has the same entitlement, then India would be able to provide more than 1000% of value of production as amber box in 2020. Now take the reverse case. If all the members of the WTO had the same entitlement as the Indian farmers, then US, Australia, Canada can't give more than 0.3% of their value of production in 2020. So this show that this approach, this consideration need to be considered when developing countries are negotiating discipline on trade distorting sport. Then the next question, what are the issues related to import surge and policy instrument? As I told that developed country can provide huge subsidies. If they are provide huge subsidies, then they can export in the international market. And then it may happen that in India, we have import surge that suddenly you have more agriculture products are coming in the market. Thus, there is import surge of agricultural goods. What will happen? Domestic prices will be depressed. The income of farmers and welfare of farmers will be adversely affected by the import surges. Uh, we have calculated uh, the import surges, and what we found that in 348 agriculture products, we have import surges where the import has increased more than 10%. Uh, of average three year import and previous three year import. Now, what is the protection uh, for Indian government to protect from the import surges? Only instrument which Indian government has to protect from import surges under the WTO is increase the tariff up to bound tariff. And this applied tariff, uh, applied the bound tariff is the maximum tariff a country can impose on the uh, on a particular good under the WTO rules. Now the applied tariff cannot cross bound tariff in normal circumstances. So the, the upper limit is uh, the uh, bound tariff. Now, even if the government increase tariff up to bound level, even if there is import surge, so what are the instrument through which the government can protect the interest of the farmers. Now, under the agreement, there is the agreement on safeguard. There are provisions are there for the import surges, but it's really very difficult to use in case of agriculture products because to 
to uh, to have uh, to impose safeguard duty there should be a investigation and where there we need information regarding producers income profit then uh, return on investment and other variables given the fact that we have millions of farmers and many of them are small farmers it's difficult to uh, collect information on the relevant uh, relevant uh, aspect of uh, of production and the profit now for the developed country they they have flexibility they are not applying they can do under the agreement on agriculture they if they import sir they automatically they just impose special safeguard under agriculture they no need to prove any injury to the farm they no need for the investigation and this it mainly this is mainly only available only for the selected members at the wto and therefore the de developing country in the negotiations they are demanding special safeguard mechanism that in case if there is a import surge then developing country can impose additional custom duty to protect the farmer interest so this is also a very important issue at the wto negotiation now there are uh, uh issues are related to export competition and cotton subsidies uh, in cotton also uh, the us is uh, the major exporter of the cotton now if you see the uh, the cost uh, of cultivation or per kg cost india uh, has competitive advantage in cotton production but still the us which export more than 80 to 90% of its production in the international market but they are uh, making the narrative that the plight of the farmers in the ldc and, and uh, ldc countries especially in african countries is due to the support by given by the indian government so these narratives have been made by uh, at the wto now the important point here that we are not giving much support in compared to the farmers in the us us is giving huge support to their agriculture to their cotton farmers as well their more than 70 to 80% subsidy is accounted by top 1 to 10% farmers there so there is no, uh, there is uneven uh, playing field at the international front so i am going to sum up with uh, this that without addressing the concern of developing members related to outdated erp capping of product specific by de minimis limit inequities in per farmer entitlement and prevailing socio economic constraint in the agriculture negotiation a level playing field would remain elusive for the farmers of the developing members for further readings uh, these are the some of the readings if uh, uh, you want to see the implication of various proposals various what is going on i uh, request all the participants to visit center for wto website uh, for more updates about uh, uh, what's going on in the wto and i would like to thank uh, center for wto studies as well as professor das especially for the feedback on this powerpoint presentation and i also would like to thank that uh, my dedicated team uh of the center for wto studies to for compiling this report thank you thank you very much dr sharma for this illuminating talk it is a very complex subject and i can assure the audience that even the joint secretaries in the ministry and the officers who get posted to the wto mission indian mission in geneva take time to understand the intricacies so thank you very much dr sharma for trying thank to make you. it simple i know that Uh, even now uh, things are not quite clear to many of us so we will take some of the questions there is a question from dr kavita at gurgaon you have already answered it but i think you may like to elaborate is there a problem of changing the base year from 1986 to something else uh under the agreement 
under the agreement on agriculture, uh, the base is 1986-88, and that's what we are demanding. Under the agreement, there is no uh, provision. But in the negotiations, we are demanding that it should be based on current uh, year or previous three year uh, external reference price. And G33 in uh, 2030, we also made one proposal in this regard that external reference price should be it should be more relevant otherwise it's totally illogical and it's totally unfair with the, the developing country and the farmers in the global south okay now there is another question from uh Mr. Murli kalumal he's asking can we expand the list of uh, agricultural products covered uh, under the specific support so he says that instead of rice, can the government procure jowar, bajra, ragi, and maize, etc., and will that qualify for uh, support processes under the WTO negotiations? If I understand uh, the question is that whether we can uh, uh, provide support to the courses serial, uh, that's uh, because the voice is breaking bit, so that's why. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, the, we also uh, procured the courses area and we also notified in our domestic support notification and uh, uh, we have policy space for in case of the courses area but in case of uh, rice yes we have crossed the 10 percent limit and we invoke the peace clause still on the courses area we have enough policy space and uh, we also have peace clause in case of uh, uh, we cross uh, the prescribed limit in the future Okay, thank you. Now there is another question. Uh, the bills, three bills have become acts in the last few days. They have been passed by the parliament. So how much the Indian farmers of India, especially with respect to our standing in WTO? What is the relationship between these bills and our stand in WTO? Okay. Uh, see, what at the WTO we are doing, we are trying to protect our policy space. These three bills are domestic issue and uh, no doubt there are a lot of attack at the WTO regarding our domestic sport measures. Uh, but these issues are not uh, related to the WTO, these are the domestic issues. But the one thing is there that the developed countries they are also they are giving uh, they are protecting their farmers through different programs i give you the one example uh, take the case of the us us uh, during the trade war with the china they have announced the package of 28 billion which is amounted to 196000 crore rupees for the farmers just to mitigate the adverse impact due to the trade war can a developing country think about this? No. So there is need for the effective government intervention, not excess intervention. So the point here is that at the WTO center and uh, what we are doing, we're trying to protect the policy space so that the government can implement their domestic policies uh, policy without uh, any problem. So this is the main point I want to highlight. Thank you. Another question is uh, the definition of small farmers. So uh, how acceptable is the definition you gave 10 hectares per person? Has India faced any challenge on account of this definition? See, this definition we have taken, uh, adopted during our schedule of commitment during 1986-88 in the schedule of commitment. Now, this definition is not fixed because uh, the low income uh, or resource poor definition varies country to country. A country can define its low uh, farmers in a different way. But in India, in our schedule of commitment, we have defined on the basis of land holding size. And the land holding size is 10 hectares we had taken in case of pakistan they have adopted five hectares so that definition varies, uh, varies country to country and we receive uh, frequently also uh, we receive questions regarding the definition of low income or resource poor farmer but uh, under the wto we can define our uh, the uh, definition of farmers okay 
There is a question from a very knowledgeable person, uh, Mr. Afsar Jafri, who himself has been studying and writing about India's stand in WTO. He says, uh, what is the threat today? Uh, to in, uh, the question is not clear. He did not write the full line, but I am trying to understand. Uh, so what is the threat today as far as India's food security is concerned? Okay, the threat, uh, uh, as I discussed, that uh, our food security policy is uh, related to the MSP policy. Now, the minimum support price is under challenge, frequent challenge. Uh, they are, even uh, yesterday, there was a committee on agriculture uh, meeting. The question also raised about the minimum support price policy. And uh, the developed country and many countries, they are attacking our minimum support price policy. If we there is no uh, MSP, then there would be no then it will be difficult for the government to procure uh, food grains for the PDS system. And if there is no procurement, then how we implement, it, uh, implement the PDS? So this is the major challenge. This uh, The challenge of MSP, I give you one more example. In case of uh, uh, this policy, not only specific to India. In case of uh, the MSP kind of policy, also implemented in China as well. In case of China, they uh, they stop increasing the MSP kind, uh, This uh, they don't call it MSP, the, the price support for wheat and rice for some year. And for corn and cotton, they have eliminated the minimum support price kind of policy. So this is the important that if there is no MSP, it would be difficult to procure. If there is no procurement, how we, we will distribute to the poor people and how we will take care we uh, able to effectively implement National Food Security Act 2030. Yes, uh, there is another question. Can we cover wood species agroforestry under the EMSP regime? You have touched upon it, but you would like to explain. Uh, uh, under the agreement on agriculture, uh, the woods and the forestry products not come under the agreement on agriculture. So the rules which I have given, uh, this is not covered by the agreement on agriculture at all because they are come under the industrial product. Okay, so Mr. Varun, the wood species and agroforestry cannot be covered under the MSP regime. Now, I have a few no, questions. No, no. Yes. No, no it's I can't. Uh, just run. It's can't. Uh, I'm saying that it's not cover the agreement on agriculture. The other provisions of the WTO would cover that. I'm not saying that this can't implement, but the rules are different. Okay, so um, I have a few questions. Uh, India has been calculating the support provided by taking into account the actual procurement instead of total production. So we calculate the aggregate measure of support on the actual procurement, which is about 35-40% of the total production. So demand has been made in the last few days that MSP should be made into a law. So how do you see that? Of course, we know that it is not going to be accepted, but how will it uh, compare with our commitment to WTO? See, about the WTO commitment, uh, already told uh, that this MSP for the food security purposes uh, is covered under uh, under the peace clause for the, uh, for the staple crops. But about uh, the point here is that uh, about the legal act of uh, uh, about the MSP is a domestic issue. It's a total domestic issue, and uh, uh, they need to more discussion uh, in this regard. The point here is that yes, we need effective intervention of the government uh, to support our farmers, because uh, if we take the example of the other country which I mentioned there uh, in the, my presentation. Even the government there, they are not leaving the farmers at the mercy of the market. They are different programs. They are supporting their farmers. What is the uh, best alternative to protect the farmers or provide safety net to the farmers that need more discussion? And yes, they need for the safety net for the farmers so that they can be protected from the price fluctuation and uh, fluctuation in the income as well. Okay, very good. Now, um, this year we may be procuring about 50 million tons of rice. Uh, you mentioned that we have already breached the limit of 10%. So what do you think happening to our commitment uh, as we go on increasing our procurement of rice? And 
both. And uh, secondly, my last question, and then we come to end of this, uh, this session. My last question is that we are sitting on huge stock of wheat and rice, especially wheat. So can we export from the stocks which have been procured at MSP? See, yes, the procurement had increased uh, in the recent times. Uh, we have uh, the government uh, had uh, procured, the government agency had procured uh, the food grains uh, in the recent times, the quantity had increased. But the food grains, uh, as I told you that uh, the food grains, uh, because we are procuring for the food security purposes, is covered under the peace clause. So whatever, whatever the quantity we are procuring uh, from the farmers at the MSP, we can uh, protect under the peace clause, this thing. Now the second question is whether we can export it. There is a uh, catch here. That because the members are saying that uh, because uh, this is a food security uh, purposes you are procuring, then exporting in the international market can endanger the food security of the other countries. So there are some problems and many questions uh, we are facing at the WTO. Yes, there is a challenge in the regard in this regard of exporting uh, food grains from the public stock holding. This is the one catch there. Thank you very much. There are a few more questions, but that have come very late. So, Mr. Narayan Prasad, I beg your pardon. Uh, I think there will be another opportunity to take up more questions and discuss some of these very important issues. So, thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. I would like to record our gratitude to you for finding time to prepare the presentation and to brief our viewers about this very complex negotiations at WTO. As uh, we have seen, uh, nobody is a permanent friend. Every country has its own interest and trade wars are always going on. Even though on strategic matters, uh, the countries may stay close to each other, but on trade matters, the countries are having very serious and intense discussions all the time. And that is why there is a need to understand these issues in detail, not only by our negotiators, in Geneva and in the Ministry of Commerce, but also by our media, by our informed people who formulate the public opinion, so that the farmers, the uh, media persons, etc., become aware of the intricacies of negotiations, what have we committed, and how far can we go in supporting our farmers. Thank you very much, and thank you to thank the IIC you. also. Now, thank let you. me announce the next lecture in this very important and interesting series. Uh, we have seen in the last few days a lot of coverage in media about the three acts passed by Parliament on Agriculture Marketing, Contract Farming and Essential Commodities Act. We have also seen enormous coverage in electronic media, digital media and print media. However, a lot of things um, have still not been explained. So. Uh, in general, the coverage of agriculture by our media will be the topic of the next lecture, which is scheduled on 23rd of October 2020. Please join. I am thankful to Mr. Harveer Singh, who was the editor of Hindi Outlook. He will he has agreed to deliver this lecture. This particular lecture will be in Hindi and it will be about the coverage of agriculture in media. So I'm sure that uh, many of you who have joined today will also find time to join this lecture on 23rd of October 2020. Thank you very much India International Center for hosting this series and giving us this opportunity to explain some of the complex issues of Indian agriculture and livelihood to your audience. Thank you very much the audience for joining in from across India and perhaps also from across the world. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for providing this opportunity. Thank you.